Hello, I'm back for part two of the Kentucky Bluegrass Award book talk. Uh, so I've got three books I'm going to go over today. Uh, the first one is Cracking the Bell. This is by Jeff Herbach. So on the back cover, it just has some reviews. And on the inside of the book jacket, it gives a little synopsis. And then I'll read a little bit from the first page or two. Ah, cracking the bell. Isaiah loves football. In fact, football saved Isaiah's life, giving him structure and discipline after his sister's death tore his family apart. Now nothing makes Isaiah happier than setting up the perfect defense and delivering a big hit. But when Isaiah gets knocked out cold on the field, he learns there's a lot more to lose than football. While recovering from a concussion, Isaiah wonders what his life would look like without the game. All his friends are on the team, and Isaiah knows they can't win without him. There's also the scholarship offer from Cornell, which is only on the table if he keeps playing. And without football, what would keep his family together? What would prevent him from sliding back into the habits that nearly destroyed him? As Isaiah begins to piece his life together with help from unexpected places, he must decide how much he's willing to sacrifice for the sport that gave him everything, even if playing football threatens to take away his future. Jeff Herbach reveals the dangerous concussion crisis in football through the eyes of a high school team captain in a powerful and important story about identity, family, friendship, and love for the game. All right, so... Turn. Uh, okay, I might read like the first two pages. Chapter 1, September 28, Cracking the Bell. Football has been, <clears throat> excuse me, football has been my medicine. It has given me a singularity of purpose. It is the tower I built on which I stand and see everything around me. I'm a defensive player, but that doesn't mean football is simple seek and destroy like some people might think. I captain the defense, which takes smarts, especially the way I play the game. I'm not some firing missile. I'm a smart bomb, communicating subtly, like through fungal mycelium, to a network of other smart bombs, my killer teammates. On the field, the world goes into vignette mode on Instagram. I'm in this dark tunnel, except for a brightly lit place right in the center where everything makes sense. I shout in alignment, read how the offense sets up, call out adjustments, Verbally, with my eyes, with hand gestures, signal plays to watch for, react to action in the backfield, take on blocks. The world makes sense on the football field. Even on September 28, apparently. In fact, as soon as we left the locker room, my bone-tired heaviness, my thoughts of my sister, Hannah, and poor mom and Grandpa John, they went away, and all there was in front of me was grass, jersey, helmet, the mechanics of Lancaster's offense lit in a bright Instagram vignette. Screw Lancaster. I'm not a kind person on the football field. Yes, I play smart, but after I make my reads, I'm free to destroy. In the fourth quarter of a heavyweight bout that featured far more defense than offense, we led Lancaster by six points. But as time fled, Lancaster had the ball. They're really good. They're the monsters of the Southwest Wisconsin, Wisconsin Conference. They drove the length of the field. Their huge linemen, having finally exhausted our front seven, paved the way for Jimmy Gents and Jake Brogley, their fleet-footed running backs. With just over a minute left, they moved all the way down to our 22-yard line, but I didn't lose faith. I knew this business. I knew my place in it. I'd studied so much film. I had a research paper full of evidence proving they got conservative when they hit this part of the field. Most teams who played them lost confidence, lost their will to fight. Most teams got run over easily. Why would Lancaster do anything risky? Most teams laid down and lost, not us. So that is the first two pages of Cracking the Bell. Obviously, if you like football, you would like this book. Um, sounds like the writing is pretty good and um, especially if you are somebody who has taken an interest in the debate about uh, concussions and student athletes that would be a good book for you to check out. All right, the second one is called Heroin by Mindy McGinnis. 
um, on the back cover, it says, <clears throat> I am not a changed person. I go to school on Monday and no one knows that I've crossed the line. I've not become someone else. There is no sign on my chest. I'm not accused of anything. I think that's a reference to the scarlet letter. I admit to myself that I am a heroin user while also updating in my mind what that actually means. I'm not a wasted person. I'm not prowling the streets. I'm not an addict. I'm a girl spinning her locker combination. I'm a girl who got a B on her math test. I'm a girl who has two holes on the inside of her arm, but they do not tell the whole story of me. Sounds interesting. Okay, uh, then from the inside of the front book jacket, it says, three screws in her hip, two months until spring training, one answer to all her problems. Mickey Catalan's life has been littered with struggles, from the scars that tell of past injuries to her parents' divorce to the daily complexity of finding the right words to fit in socially. Mickey is no stranger to pain, emotional or physical. When a car crash sidelines her months before softball season, Mickey has to find a way to hold on to her spot as the catcher for a team expected to make a historic tournament run. Behind the plate is the only place she's ever felt comfortable, and the painkillers she's been prescribed can help her get back there. The pills do more than take away the pain. They make her feel good. With a new circle of friends, fellow injured athletes, others with just time to kill, Mickey finds peaceful acceptance in people with whom words come easily, even if it is just the pills loosening her tongue. But as the pressure to be Mickey Catalan heightens, her need increases, and it becomes less about pain and more about want, something that could send her spiraling out of control. Edgar Award-winning author Mindy McGinnis lays bare an honest exploration of the opioid crisis through the eyes of one girl, a visceral and necessary story about addiction, family, friendship, and hope. Uh, it does say on the inside of the book, this book contains realistic depictions of opioid use. Recovered and recovering addicts should proceed with caution. Um, so I'm going to, there's a prologue that's about two pages, so I will just read the prologue. When I wake up, all my friends are dead. I don't know when they stopped breathing or how long I slept while they dropped off one by one. Josie's basement is a windowless place where time does not matter. The lights set low. She sprawled across a couch, lips gone gray underneath the plumbing, plumping lip gloss she uses to cover the fact that she started shredding them with her teeth, devouring herself with need when there's no needle in reach. I try to get up, my hip refusing to carry me in the pivotal moment when I rise. I bump into the coffee table, sending a syringe rolling onto the floor. Shit. Josie, I say, putting my fingers to her wrist. I don't know how to find a pulse, don't know what fingers I'm supposed to be using or if I'm touching her in the right place. I try the side of her neck, but get nothing, her skin cool. It's expensive skin, the kind that's never had too much sun or been too dry. Josie's never had calluses on her palms like mine, and she paid to have the one scar on her body lasered away. Me, I'm a map of pain. Needle pricks you could connect all over my skin to make constellations named things like agony and writhing woman, all of them converging to form a supernova at my hip, one that pulses and breathes on the verge of imploding into a black hole. Even the fingernails I'm pressing against Josie's throat have dirt under them, tiny grains I've carried with me since this afternoon from behind home plate. I can still feel the sun on my back from where it baked in, now trying to seep out, escape the darkness of this cave and the dead inside it. I am thinking the same. I check Derek and Luther, but they're gone. I curl my fingers with Luther's, our knuckle bones near each, one, near each other one last time, the closest we'll ever get to a conversation about us and what that word could have meant. I sneak up the stairs as if afraid I will wake them, the dose in my blood keeping me calm as I go out the back door. In the yard, I move under the cover of trees that I doubt Josie ever climbed as a child, though I would have taught her how if I'd known her then. Instead, I met her later, and the only thing she learned from me is how to find a vein. 
I start my car but keep the lights off as I back out of the driveway, not turning them on until I'm out of the cul-de-sac. It's dark and I'm driving exactly the speed limit because I am a good girl. I'm a student athlete and the catcher for an undefeated, undefeated softball team and a senior who needs to get a good night's sleep before her last league game. I did not just watch my friends die. I did not leave their bodies cooling in a basement. I am not an addict. Okay, so this would probably be an interesting book for anybody who is obviously concerned about the opioid crisis. Um, if you like true stories, um, this it's not a true story, but like, uh, you know, stories that are more realistic fiction. That's what I meant to say. Sorry. Okay, and then the final one, this is, I believe, um, part of a series or a planned series. Um, this is called The Athena Protocol, and the author is Shamim Sarif. On the back, it says, You want control, I say, but when we fight, we're in a dark place, the kind of place that most people don't want to admit they have inside where they're savage and brutal and can hurt and kill. I stop because I feel my voice crack. Lee is absolutely still, watching me. I clear my throat and speak again. We all believe in the work we do for Athena, but some of that work is dirty, and maybe we should stop trying to pretend that it isn't. Um, just a couple comments from reviewers or other authors. Yeah, these are other authors about the book. So Patrick Ness um, from the New York Times bestselling author list says, imagine if Mission Impossible were, were run by young, brilliant, ultra-skilled female operatives who undertook rogue operations to save the women and girls of the world from kidnappers and traffickers. More, please. And Natalie C. Anderson, author of City of Saints and Thieves, says, Finally, the female version of James Bond we've been waiting for, with a diverse cast of heroes and villains, a global scope, and just a hint of romance, it makes taking down the patriarchy fun. On the inside book jacket, Jesse Archer wasn't supposed to shoot to kill. As a member of Athena, an elite team of female operatives who travel the world enforcing vigilante justice, Jessie is supposed to capture targets alive, but this time she couldn't stop herself from losing control. Now she's been kicked out of Athena, right before a huge mission investigating human trafficking in Belgrade. Jessie knows that her actions threaten the entire Athena operation. It's her fault. It's, it's not her fault. It's her fault that they'll be down an agent. And she knows how much harder the mission will be to pull off without her. Even if she isn't on the team anymore, she needs to right her wrong and prove herself. So she starts her own investigation. But going rogue presents challenges that Jesse didn't anticipate. A hunch she's been following reveals some serious leads. But working alone means no one is watching her back as she delves deeper into the horror she uncovers. Meanwhile, her former teammates have been ordered to bring her down. Jessie must face down danger from all sides if she's to complete her mission and survive. Mm. Okay. All right, I'm going to read like the first two pages. Sometimes I wonder if the world might just look better through a rifle scope, crisper, clearer, narrowed down, less messy. In my crosshairs, a boy, a boy soldier, just a teenager, not much younger than me, is asleep. Mouth slightly open, hand flung over his eyes to block the glimmering dawn light that started to spread into the sky. I can even see the tired threads on the frayed collar of his stained camouflage jacket. I shift my rifle to the left, where, farther back, behind a stand of thorny trees, is a squat concrete building where this militia group's leader, Ahmed, sleeps. Then I swing right, over to the caged area where the 50 or so girls they kidnapped three months ago are trapped. Everyone is asleep. The soldiers, their hostages, their leader. I wait and listen to the other two women beside me. 
lying so close to me that the lengths of our bodies are almost touching, is Hala. I feel her shift, and behind us, Caitlin coughs, quietly, suppressing the sound, although we are too although we are way too high up and far back from the camp for anyone to hear us. I cough too. The air here is dry, scratchy dry, catching in your throat every time you breathe. The smell of scorched earth rises up to my nose again, the smell of West Africa. For a moment, I think about the tarnished metal smell of rainy streets in London at home, but it doesn't last long, and I cough again. Short delay on the incoming trucks, Caitlin says softly. Three, four minutes. Hala and I relax off our rif rifle scopes, and I turn to look at Caitlin over my shoulder while I use my water bottle to knock away a dead cockroach that lies next to me. She's listening to a feed in her ear. I'm hungry, Hala says. Hala is always eating or thinking about eating. Caitlin reaches into her small backpack and tosses us each a protein bar. I'm not thrilled with it, but I doubt she has fresh croissants in there, so I keep quiet and take it. Hala eats hers fast, without comment, fueling up. I swallow mine with less enthusiasm. The cold slide of sweetness in my mouth is disgusting. I try to remember that millions of children are starving in Africa and that I have no right to complain, especially since we'll be back home tomorrow. Let's get set up again, Caitlin orders kindly. Something about Caitlin's American accent, which is a complete drawl like something out of a cowboy movie, makes me feel even more British. Hala and I obey, leaning into our rifle scopes, eyes focused once more down on the militia camp below. We're all in the same positions we took the first night we were here, when we were just watching, tweaking the plan. Christ, that was a rubbish night. When I finally got to sleep, I was thrilled to dream of something else. We have these contact lenses that zoom in and out depending on how you blink, so even from up here we had a perfect view of the soldiers. I hadn't expected them to be so young. You see videos about child soldiers in Africa, but these weren't kids, and yet they weren't men either. Probably recruited willingly by Ahmed and his terrorist militia. If you're stuck in a village working the land all day to plant crops that may never actually grow, maybe Ahmed gives you something to believe in and guns to play with. We watched them that night, laughing, teasing each other the way boys do, scrapping in little fights that rose up like boiling water and then evaporated as fast. The bloodied noses, shouts, and shoves, I could handle that. But what they did to the girls, these 50 girls they had captured from a distant village in an attempt to blackmail the government into releasing prisoners, none of us could watch what they were doing, and none of us could look at each other. So that is the Athena Protocol. Um, it sounds like it's based on real life, so not really like fantasy, but more um, kind of mystery action adventure type story. Uh, it was compared to Mission Impossible and James Bond. So um, those are three more of the Kentucky Bluegrass Award books for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, if you are interested in any of them, let me know. Ms. Schaus is going to see if she can find some uh, to get in the library as soon as possible. And um, just talk to your English teacher uh, whenever we come back to school about possibly doing some extra credit on uh, some of these books if you read any of them. So the last three books I will be reviewing soon. And for my students, um, I'm going to have a book talk form that you can fill out for these books um, if you want to get extra credit for this school year. Okay, so um, that's it. Stay safe. Make sure you're washing your hands and uh, see you soon, I hope.